Hunter Bay's mayor says it's time to close down the Chippewa Park Zoo. The regional hospital moves to make more bed space. And work set to begin on the new Nipigon River Bridge. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Mayor Keith Hobbs says he thinks it's time to shut down the Chippewa Park Wildlife Exhibit. The local attraction has made some negative headlines lately after the recent death of the park's moose. But not everyone agrees with the mayor's assessment. There are some, including those on council, who feel there's value in retaining the wildlife exhibit. Dennis Ward has more. Should we really be Mayor Keith Hobbs says he's being bombarded with emails and messages from people who are calling for the closure of the wildlife exhibit. The mayor says the recent death of the attraction's moose hasn't helped matters, but Hobbs questions whether the city should be in the business of operating a zoo. I want to have a look at it. Um, you know, I know there's a couple of councillors that aren't happy with me for this stand, but um, I really don't think we should be in the animal uh, exhibit business. Uh, something MNR, uh, Greenpeace maybe, uh, you know, other animal groups that could, could be in it, uh, but I don't think it's a city function. Councillor Ian Angus, who helped start the Friends of Chippewa Park, says the wildlife exhibit is a key part of what's offered at Chippewa. He adds 30,000 visitors a year pay to see the region's wildlife in their natural setting. Angus feels there does need to be investments in the physical structure and more staff to improve the environment. Councillor Andrew Folds also believes the wildlife exhibit has value as an attraction and for educational purposes. He says it is important to look at how it's operated and see if there's ways to improve the service both for the animals and the public. I certainly would welcome any evaluation of this facility to see if there, is a, if there are gaps in, in how we're providing the service and if there are improvements. I mean, the reality is that uh, tens of thousands of people uh, go to Chippewa. They go and visit this wildlife. Uh, it's a tourist attraction. It's one more thing that people can do out there. The mayor has talked to the city manager about getting out of the business altogether. However, that would be a decision made by the whole of council. The wildlife exhibit currently loses about $70,000 a year. Dennis Ward, TBT News. Plans are in the works for the first phase of a waterfront recreation trail in Thunder Bay. The proposed route will span from Fisherman's Park at the mouth of the current river to Mission Island Marsh. The city has hired True Grit Consulting to develop the trail improvement plan, complete with both short-term and long-term goals. Initially, a recreation trail may have to travel along existing roadways until a physical route can be developed, says City Parks Planner Werner Schwar. The city does not own all the land along the waterfront. We do own some road right-of-ways with pieces of private property in between. So yeah, in some places like from Current River Mouth to Marina Park, we would be forced to go along the Court Street bike path for a ways until we got to McVicker Creek and then we'd be able to follow the trail through the park, through Marina Park. And then again in the short term it would need to follow roadway to get to the islands and Mission Island. We've got lots of 10 years or more before a completed trail is in use. The plan is expected to be presented to the city's Waterfront Development Committee this fall. The Thunder Bay Coast Guard was called into action this afternoon to rescue two people on a boat in the local harbour. At about 1 o'clock, the 26-foot bay liner began to take on water in its engine compartment. A Coast Guard crew responded on a Zodiac rescue vessel and pulled the boat and its occupants safely to the local yacht club dock. There is another big union merger in the works. On the heels of the CAW and CEP becoming known as Uniform, the United Steel Workers and Telecommunications Workers Union are now looking to join forces. And the unions arrived at a tentative merger agreement yesterday. There's been a working agreement in place between the two entities for the past three years. The TWU represents nearly 13,000 members across the country, while the United Steelworkers represents 225,000, including roughly 2,000 members locally. Local USW spokesperson Herb Danaher says the merger isn't simply about growth, it's about becoming more effective. They add something to our organization. We have a critical mass in the sector now, uh, and we're going to have some influence. And that's what steel workers like to do in these mergers, is that we like to have a, like a foothold or a toehold in, in all the strategic areas uh, in the business communities so that we can uh, start moving the pendulum forward and, and again, change working conditions for, for the people who work in the industries and, and uh, organize the unorganized and, and uh, you know, build a labor movement in Canada. And it's all big growth. 
Danaher anticipates the telecommunications workers to retain a measure of autonomy under the United Steelworkers umbrella. In a joint press release issued by the unions, TWU President Lee Riggs says the merger is, quote, about better bargaining power, about better service to members, and about a strong voice for telecommunication workers. Officials at Thunder Bay Regional have announced the hospital's newest measure to combat overcrowding and code gridlock. Sunrooms on the medical and surgical units will be turned into patient care areas when needed. Tara Allaire reports. Seven sunrooms will be converted to accommodate patients once capacity is reached. They'll return to their original function when there's no need for the beds. Hospital President Andre Robichaud says overflow patients are currently housed in the hallways of nursing units, an uncomfortable situation that doesn't meet the fire code. We're uh, doing some renos, we're removing carpets, we're going to put some curtains in. There, there's already um, oxygen and suction, so people that built this institution probably did think that one day that we may need these rooms, and we're putting in some call belts. Robichaud stressed that the sun rooms, often used as family meeting areas, will only be used in gridlock situations something that happens all too often at the hospital. So this morning we have uh, 59 uh, ALC, so that really means that if we had appropriate uh, community support, be it long-term care, assisted living, or other types, we would have 59 patients less in our beds. Uh, so um, it's not getting any better. Uh, we were uh, in gridlock quite a bit this summer. We're not right now. Uh, and uh, we're not looking forward to the fall and the winter when people do get sick. The renovations to the sunrooms should be completed by mid-October at a cost of $165,000. Tara Lair, TBT News. After some initial controversy, the redevelopment of the old Sir John A. Macdonald School is almost complete. The original plan called for the school to be converted into a 13-unit condo with the schoolyard turned into 48 housing lots. But when neighbours objected and that plan fell through, Nordman Engineering acquired the school to house the company's new headquarters. It's been almost a year since the process started, but it's finally near completion. The interior of the building has been completely replaced. Spaces have been repurposed for offices. The entire electric and communication systems are new. And the exterior of the building has also undergone a facelift. Instead of having three offices, the company is now all under one roof. Nordman President Chris Doherty says that was the biggest issue they faced. After investing $3.3 million into the project, he's relieved that the finish line is in sight. And he's hoping the city's planning department becomes more open-minded when it comes to repurposing older infrastructure. Demonstrating at this point that having this sort of a business in this sort of a neighbourhood is not detrimental in any way, shape or form. I mean, even though it's, it's not in, a, in what is typically seen as a core area, has really picked this neighbourhood up. Uh, it, is, it has taken what was a, a derelict building uh, that was becoming a real source of problems for the neighbourhood and turned it into something that's a real positive. Doherty adds that all of the neighbours have been great through the whole process. They're still working to clean up the wooded areas and finish paving around the building, but everything is expected to be complete by the end of September. Meanwhile, another school redevelopment remains stuck in neutral. Nearly one year ago, officials with Crossroads Alcohol and Drug Recovery Centre announced plans to relocate into the former Oliver Road School. However, there has been little activity at the property since then. Crossroads Director Kathy Sanderson says they can't move ahead with their plans until Ministry of Health approvals are in place. Highway travelers can expect to see some activity beginning soon at the new Nipigon River Bridge as work crews have begun unloading their equipment and setting up shop for the construction of the $106 million landmark. Crews with Bot Construction and Tom Jones Construction have been mobilizing for the past week, preparing to begin work on the first cable stayed bridge in all of Ontario. The bridge is expected to be finished in 2017, a prominent feature on the newly developed four-lane highway between Nipigon and Thunder Bay. Nipigon Mayor Richard Harvey says the town is preparing for all possible spin-offs from the development. We're working with Bot Construction to try and look at how the municipality can be prepared and ready for the influx of workers, how we can work together to make sure that this is a win-win for everyone. It's exciting. I mean, it's the one thing that you hear everyone in the region talking about is this bridge. It is going to be a, a real eye popper. It's going to be a great uh, tourism attraction, uh, not only when it's completed, but even during construction. 
Harvey says he recently met with the Minister of Transportation at the AMO conference to ensure the province stays true to their commitment to establish a new scenic lookout and rest area near the bridge. The building that has sat vacant in Thunder Bay's North Core is getting a makeover, and the city's ent entertainment district is about to get some more variety. Roxy's nightclub is making the move from Memorial Avenue to Red River Road, and the general manager says that's good news for other operations in the area. Roxy's nightclub has applied for a liquor license for the old McNulty's department store. The location has also served as a gym over the years, but has sat vacant for some time now. Roxy's general manager, Frank Marino, says moving into the area made sense and adds the location is right in the center of all the action. This for everybody. We're going to end up bringing probably another five, 600 people to the downtown, downtown core on the weekends anyways. Uh, if anybody walk, uh, coming in. Downtown Waterfront BIA Vice Chair Jim Camusi says it's exciting to see someone spending money to revitalize the downtown area. Muzi hopes the clientele is conducive to the resurgence of the North Core, feels the nighttime bar business needs some controls in place, and believes there will be. It's into the downtown core, and what we've really found is more businesses and more residential people coming into the downtown core have created their own security. And uh, for that, uh, more eyes on the street, and, and uh, uh, it's created a, a feeling of comfort for more people to come and be able to walk into the downtown area. Plans were previously announced to convert the current Roxy's and Tonic nightclub into an electronic gaming center operated by Thunder Bay Community Bingo. The man named by the province to head up its ring of fire negotiations has also taken on another job. Toronto Police Chief Bill Blair announced today that retired Supreme Court Justice Frank Iacobucci will conduct a review of the police service's use of force policies. The move comes after another retired judge stepped away from the role following conflict of interest allegations. The review was sparked by the shooting death of 18-year-old Sami Yatim by a Toronto police officer. It's the last long weekend of summer and many are hoping to get out on the water and enjoy the outdoors one last time. But the Thunder Bay OPP is urging boaters and swimmers to use caution during the holiday weekend. This summer alone has seen five drowning deaths in the Thunder Bay area. Staff Sergeant Jim Graham says wearing personal flotation devices will help people enjoy the water without having to deal with needless tragedies. He says the drownings this summer were a result of unfortunate or bad judgments and all of them involved some degree of alcohol. It's, it's not just the boating, it's the alcohol in and around the water itself um, because the swimming incidents have also involved alcohol and, and led to tragedy. So I think it's because swimming in the water is a recreation activity more than driving is and so people are consuming alcohol not necessarily in the boat or on the water but are consuming alcohol and then going for a swim or a canoe ride or something of that uh, nature and then just not exercising the best judgment when they're doing it. So, The OPP will be performing regular enforcement activities on waterways, highways and trails this holiday weekend. Switch and now to uh, weather. Uh, Fiona, it was breezy uh, and sort of seasonal. Not all in all, not a bad start to uh, the final long weekend in summer. Well, it's certainly uh, inching its way back to more seasonal values. The humidex not uh, quite as extreme. But there were a few uh, areas across northwestern Ontario that were seeing uh, some pop up thunder showers throughout. So a lot of instability still. Uh, coming into play this afternoon. But Thunder Bay, despite all of that, still topped out with a high of 23, which is still a couple of degrees above normal. Humidex made it feel a little closer to 29, but there was also increasing cloud uh, on some parts of the city, probably a little more so on the north side than the south. But it was pretty gray at times this afternoon with winds from the north. At this hour, gray skies uh, in many locations across the region, although Fort Francis and uh, into International Falls on the other side of the border is seeing a lot of sunshine, a lot of humidity. They're kind of getting a burst of it. It currently feels like about 31, 32 at this hour under sunny skies. Everybody else a little bit cooler, a little bit grayer. Uh, it's causing some interesting uh, potential for tonight. Now, if you are heading down to the marina, we've got another family night, of course. Uh, Fast and the Furious 6 uh, should start around 9 o'clock when uh, the sun goes down, although under partly cloudy skies, it's kind of hard to say exactly when that's going to happen. But we're looking at about 17 Celsius. Winds will be very light from the north. 
but you are along the lake shore and temperatures are dropping fairly quickly tonight. So bring a blanket and a sweater because we're going to hit a low of 11 overnight. Partly uh, cloudy skies and winds will continue to be light from the north as we head into the weekend. Uh, more gusty uh, storms to the southwest bumping into pockets of precipitation throughout northwestern Ontario. We're expecting to see it more towards the end of tomorrow and uh, maybe early on Sunday. The good news is behind it, we've got some dry, refreshing air moving into the region. It's going to make for uh, fairly seasonal temperatures as we head into the first week of September and uh, some fairly sunny skies. I'll have more details on that later on in the news hour. Thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry spoke today about possible military action in Syria. Stay with us. We'll have that story and more when we return. In one impatient corner of Syria, a limited strike against the regime isn't enough. They want Bashar al-Assad removed for good. American Secretary of State John Kerry says the U.S. isn't ruling out limited military response to the Syrian crisis in the wake of the gassing of civilians. Kerry says the United States remains committed to finding a political solution. Now I add reports on the latest developments from Lebanon. 
In one impatient corner of Syria, a limited strike against the regime isn't enough. They want Bashar al-Assad removed for good. In another corner, apparently more regime bombing of the area where the U.S. is convinced more than 1,400 people died in a regime poison gas attack. In Washington, John Kerry laid out some of the evidence. We know where the rockets were launched from and at what time. We know where they landed and when. In a short unclassified report, U.S. officials explain how they believe these horrific scenes materialized. Officials say they also know further intelligence they can't share to protect sources. The world has an obligation to make sure that we maintain the norm against the use of chemical weapons. It's a strong signal the U.S. still plans to strike despite the British Parliament's the decision right, last night to vote against getting involved. The nose to the left, 285. Yeah. For the region, it's cause for concern. If not out of sympathy for Assad in some corners, then out of concern for stability. As the rhetoric intensifies, so does the anxiety, not just here in Lebanon, but across the region. The question is this, if Syria is attacked, will it retaliate? And if it does, will that unleash a chain reaction that will be impossible to control? Across the border from Syria in Israel, the military is preparing in case they too get drawn in. We are ready, but we know that things can ignite very quickly and the whole area can be affected. Still among these Syrian refugees, an assault against the regime would be welcome. The limited, narrow strike the U.S. is considering will, at least for them, change very little. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Beirut. The debate about marijuana possession has taken a new twist. Prime Minister Stephen Harper now says he's willing to look at a proposal from police chiefs to ticket instead of charge pot users. Julie Van Dusen has more. At this drop-in centre in downtown Ottawa, young men are looking for work. It's not that easy when you have a record. 19-year-old Greg Dwight is saddled with a criminal record over possession of marijuana. I haven't been able to get a couple of jobs because of it. So have you guys found a place to stay Natalie yet? Elliott manages a centre. She says convictions affect so much, including trying to rent an apartment. Some landlords do ask um, youth in particular um, if they have a criminal record because they want to know that it's a safe place. More than 600,000 Canadians now have a criminal record for pot possession. It can be a little or a lot. Any amount in Canada is illegal. Officers could spend their time doing a lot better things than chasing down a bunch of kids for smoking, again, something that grows out of the ground. You know, individuals are accountable for Police that. chiefs agree and have proposed the option of ticketing users as well as maintaining the ability to charge them. This provides our, our officers an additional tool to deal with uh, individuals who are caught with smaller amounts of marijuana. This criminologist says the option of giving out tickets is a good first step. Getting rid of the, the prospect of a criminal record uh, would, is, is a step forward. However, that still leaves intact the enormous black market in drugs, and, and that's another question entirely. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau kicked off the debate last week when he admitted that he smoked dope a few times in the past, even after becoming an MP. He says marijuana should be legalized, making it easier to monitor its use, especially among young people. Legalization is going to be a path that actually allows us to keep it out of the hands of teens who right now have easier access to buying marijuana than they do to alcohol or cigarettes. You know, him promoting uh, marijuana use for our children. Yesterday, Stephen Harper took a swipe at Trudeau, but said he would examine the option of ticketing as the police chiefs propose. The government is certainly uh, looking at uh, their proposal very carefully. Police chiefs are now waiting for the government's response to their proposal, but it's clear that marijuana use in Canada is now being talked about at the highest levels. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. Some changes today in Ottawa. Economist jean Zeni Frechette has been named the new parliamentary budget officer. He replaces Thunder Bay native Kevin Page. Rochette will oversee government spending, and critics say he has no experience analyzing budgets. James Fitzmorris explains. 
Jean-Denis Frechette is a trained economist, has been working in the Library of Parliament for 25 years. The government says he is well suited for this job, having distinguished himself as a non-partisan uh, servant to the both houses, senators and MPs. Uh, that is exactly what they would like this person to do, unlike the first parliamentary budget officer, Kevin Page, who distinguished himself by being far more uh, aggressive in his watchdog role, releasing his reports publicly, putting them up on the website, uh, talking to the media, granting interviews. These are all things that uh, forced him or caused him to run afoul of the government, draw criticism of the government. They accused him of being partisan. They accused him of being wrong sometimes, many times, despite being proven right uh, in the end, whether it be the cost of the war in Afghanistan, the cost of the F-35 purchases, or that there was a structural deficit in the government's numbers. The opposition is concerned that this new appointee will be more of a lapdog than a watchdog, so it will be up to Mr. Fashem to decide uh, exactly what he wants to take to this job, if he will follow his predecessor or if he will fall more in line with what the government would like from this position. James S. Morris, CBC News, Ottawa. Also today, the Prime Minister named Quebec Senator Claude Carignan as the new leader of the government in the Senate. The lawyer and former mayor has been deputy leader since 2011 and replaces Senator Marjorie Le Breton. Prime Minister Harper says Carignan's experience will ensure transparency and accountability in the Senate. The giant U.S. cellular company trying to break into the Canadian market is showing just how big it is. Verizon may soon spend $130 billion to buy out its principal investor. The big Canadian cell companies and unions say that kind of power will do damage here. Ron Charles explains. Unions that represent people who work in the wireless industry hit the street in front of Industry Canada's Toronto offices. They're upset by what they call Ottawa's favourable treatment of U.S. wireless giant Verizon, which is considering entering the Canadian market. We say to Verizon, no, you stay home. We want these jobs for Canadians. The unions and Canada's three big wireless carriers are working together in this fight. It makes me angry that the government is selling us out. The carriers have been running ads saying Verizon is being allowed to enter the market under favorable conditions that were originally created to allow small new carriers to get started. The Canadian carriers say this week Verizon proved it is none of the above. Verizon is in discussions to buy out its principal investor, European telecom company Vodafone, for as much as $130 billion. Verizon has a history in the United States of a hugely pr profitable company that charges the same fees, if not more, than the Canadian companies. So there's no advantage to give them an advantage into the Canadian economy. This wireless industry expert says the Canadian companies are fighting a losing battle. And so the, the polls are showing this is working in the government's favor right now. And Canadians are, well, Canadians seem to be enjoying this moment of watching the big three squirm a little bit. Verizon hasn't said when it will announce whether or not it will be coming to Canada. And so the squirming continues. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. The Duchess of Cambridge appeared at her first public engagement today since the birth last month of Prince George. Katie jo Kate joined Prince William at the opening ceremonies for an ultra-marathon race. The pair chatted with runners and spectators at the event. The grueling run circles the island where the couple live in North Wales. William works in the area as a search and rescue pilot. But the crowds didn't get to see the newest royal, baby George. The five-week-old prince stayed at home. All right, well, let's take a look at uh, the markets. The TSX closed out the week with a 50-point drop, falling to 12,653. Wall Street lost 30 points, closing at 14,810. And the Nasdaq was also down 30 points to 35,89. The Canadian dollar was virtually unchanged at 94.97 cents US. Gold fell almost $17 to $1,396 an ounce. And oil fell over a dollar to 107.65 a barrel.
Well, I think with uh, the Thunder Wolves' new players on the basketball team, uh, a lot of ladies are going to be investing in high heels. Uh, uh, I think I might need to invest, invest in some high <laughs> Those heels. Those are some in order tall to boys. Them. Yeah, a yeah. couple of a couple of seven footers, seven plus footers, uh, Randy on the team. Uh, it's really a welcome addition. They've lacked size over the past few years. Yeah, they definitely uh, have. They've actually got more size than the Toronto Raptors. When's the last time the Raptors <laughs> had a seven footer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah. that's, and if you're really nice to Holly, I'm pretty sure she'll let you uh, borrow her high heels next time you have to go to the Maybe. To the There's a plan. Ooh, we'll see. We'll there see. You go. I didn't want to have to spend money. <laughs> well, there's still two months until the beginning of the OUA basketball regular season, but for the Lakehead men's squad, they'll take all the time they can get. They've got 13 new faces that could make this year's team and only five returnees. A couple of the rookies are over seven feet tall which gives LU an added dimension they have not had in a long time. But with practices getting underway, all the players are just trying to get to know each other and start learning the systems. Matt Scooby is more. Andrew McCarthy isn't your regular recruit. Standing seven feet, one inch tall, the situate Massachusetts native has made his way to the Lakehead after struggling with injuries in the NCAA. And so far, so good. I love the guys, great team. Uh, it's great how everyone sticks together. It, um, it helps getting used to a new uh, country, but um, yeah, I like it so far. I'm not looking forward to the cold, but uh, it's been good so far. But not only has head coach Scott Morrison brought one seven-footer to Thunder Bay, he's got two. Australian Brent Wallace will also don the blue and gold this season. With the added size, there's the option to change the fast-paced style of play that LU is known for, but McCarthy says that's not the case. I definitely like to run the floor. It looks like Brent does too. We're definitely more mobile for big guys. I, uh, Justin, he's been injured since I got here, but uh, he looks like he's um, the athletic type that should be able to run with the guards. Um, other than that, the size is just a bonus. Uh, I think we should just be able to put in a bunch of work and uh, bully teams. While it's next to impossible to bully a team like Carlton, returning guard Dwayne Harvey is excited about the addition of size. Harvey was part of a small front court last year that included Greg Carter and Ben Johnson, but he's confident that the Wolves will match up better against most teams in the OUA. It's kind of tough matching up against like the Carltons when you're going up 6-3 six, six, and up. So this year, like we kind of match up really well. We'll be we'll probably, I think we'll be one of the fastest teams in the league because we're really fast this year and getting two seven footers, you can't ask for much more. The team is still in the early stages of getting to know each other and figuring things out. Anthony McIntosh, along with Harvey, are two of just five returning players this season. McIntosh is a little banged up, so he didn't practice on Friday. He admits things have been a little all over the place, but that means there's more pressure on the veterans. It's been challenging at times. You know, everybody's sort of still learning the system and, and, and getting to know guys, but it's, it's definitely a little bit more pressure on us to be, uh, to be better leaders. Um, it's, uh, it's, we, we ran a little bit for it, you know, but it's, uh, it's coming together well, I think. Now, you still has lots of time. They're hosting a four-team tournament the first weekend of October, and they don't start OUA regular season action until November 1st. Matt Scooby, TBT Sports. At the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament in New York, three of the four remaining Canadians were eliminated in men's singles. Frank Danzovich of Niagara Falls fell in straights to Tommy Robredo. In women's play, Eugenie Bouchard sent packing in three by Angelique Kerber. Alexandra Wozniak was dropped 6-3, 6-1 by second seed Victoria Azarenka. Tenth seeded Canadian Milos Raonic played his second rounder last night against Spain's Pablo Andujar, the hard-serving Canuck, took control Catches of the, the match line. early with his powerful serve, winning the first set in only 32 oh, minutes for the Nates. There's more to Ronich's game, though, than his serve. He's been working on attacking the net more, and that strategy works as he takes set 2-6-2. Two, two. Looking much sharper than he did in his opening round match, Ronich would break Andujar in the seventh game of the third set, showing his athleticism by going to the net for the smash. 22-year-old from Thornhill, Ontario was off to round three where he will face a familiar name and opponent, Spain's Feliciano Lopez, over the weekend. The Blue Jays are back in action after a day off tonight, opening a three-game series at home with Kansas City. Mark Burley will try and cool off the Royals, who have won five in a row. Week 10 in the CFL kicks off tonight in Vancouver with the BC Lions hosting Hamilton. The Ticats have won three straight. The Leo's defense will need to come up big in this one. Helmets a minute. We got our hands full, man. That's 
to me, personally, that's the best offense in the league. And, uh, you know, Henry Barris is throwing it around, man. Them guys are making big plays. They run their th their stuff well. Their spacing's good. You know, they, they create a lot of matchup problems for a lot of people. And, you know, this week is about Manu Umano. Can you beat your man in front of you? And whatever team can do that, we should win the game. I mean, they're as good as there is right now in the league. You take a look at Henry. We've played him for a lot of years. He's playing as well as he has. He's, he's, he's poising the pocket, making unbelievable throws with his arm. You talk about a multiple uh, offense and what they do in terms of packages and athletes they get the ball to. And certainly when you take a look at uh, their running back, he's as good as there is in the league. A monumental victory for ex-NFL players. The league has agreed to give them $765 million to settle concussion lawsuits from thousands of former players. The agreement comes only a week before the start of the regular season. We get more in this report. Under the proposed deal, the NFL will pay about $675 million to compensate former players who have suffered cognitive injury like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. 75 million will be used for baseline medical tests, 10 million for concussion research and education. More than 4,500 former players sued the NFL, 10 of them members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, including Dallas Cowboys running back Tony Dorsett. Others include Super Bowl winning quarterback Jim McMahon and the family of Pro Bowl linebacker Junior Seau, who committed suicide last year. The lawsuits accuse the NFL of intentionally hiding the risks of concussions to return injured players to the field and protect the league's image. Former Eagles running back Kevin Turner, who suffers from ALS, praises the deal, ending lawsuits that have the potential to drag on for years. You know, this helmet is a very important step. Turner says it will ensure that future generations of football players will not suffer. NFL Vice President Jeffrey Pash calls the settlement an important step that builds on the significant changes the league has made recently to make the game safer. A federal judge must approve the proposed settlement before it goes into effect. Chris Pallone, NBC News, New York. With NHL training camps less than two weeks away, the Vancouver Canucks have opened contract talks with the Sedin Twins. Daniel and Henrik are both entering the final year of their contract. Sedin throws it back. Daniel shoots, scores! Loyalty can be fleeting in professional sports, but the Sedins have always shown their allegiance to the Canucks. Exhibit A, the hometown discount on their current five-year, $30.5 million deals. But there's only one year left to go on those contracts, and they could be moving on after that. Not that they don't want to stay in Vancouver, it's just that there's so much to consider. I think signing a deal, there's a lot of different things that, comes, uh, that, that, that are important to guys, and it's... Uh, the city, uh, the team, the future. Uh, so there's a lot of other things uh, uh, apart from the money. So, um, like I said, it's not all about the money. Um, and that, that was the same case as, as last time as well. So uh, we'll see what happens. It will depend largely on what the Canucks are able to accomplish this year. Return to cup contending form and they may choose to stick around and finish that uncompleted project. Falter and they may find the urge to end their careers elsewhere. New dynamics on this team make it impossible to predict which way it will go. Sometimes uh, change could be good. we got pretty much the same team as before. We need young guys to step up though and play really well for us and play big minutes and, and big roles. And, um, and with the new coaching staff too, there's, I'm for sure there's going to be some changes, but uh, I think that's good for our team. John Tortorella is demanding and he will expect a lot from the Twins. Time will tell how the coach and player relationships pan out and if it eventually pays off. But for all the uncertainty in that regard, the blueprint is still pretty basic. We know what he wants from his team, and, and that's, uh, that's hard work. Um, it's a lot of... Uh, and I think that's, that's the way you, you have to play to win. I think that's uh, where we've been successful in the past, too, is where we, we're focusing on, on our defensive game, knowing that we have the, the guys that can score. And, uh, but it's got to start with, with, uh, with working hard in your own, in your own end and, and doing those things right. And... Uh, I want to talk to, to John about pretty much training camp and it's going to be a, a grind and it's going to be it's going to be a tough training camp which is uh, I think we're looking forward to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it cuz it's going to be the year of the leaf. I know you hear that on an annual basis but I'm going to be been saying that for the last 40 years. <laughs> All right. Well, on Global Thunder Bay at 8 o'clock tonight we have Bones with your full viewing lineup here's Stella Dog.
Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8, it's Bones. And Hodgins tries to decipher the recipe for Finn's family hot sauce. Then at 9 on Hawaii 5 a reporter follows the team for a day. And at 10 p.m., 16 by 9 takes a closer look at the stories that affect Canadians. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 8 on Mr. D, Jerry tries to rig a poker game to help a friend. At 8.30, after moving back home, Jen remembers why she left the first time on Layla and Jen. Then at 9 on the 5th Estate, Russ George flies against convention in his fight to save the planet. And at 11.35, George has comedic author David Sedaris in the red chair. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. Well, it's the final long weekend of the year. Everyone wants to know what the weather is going to be like for that final long weekend. Yeah, I mean, lots of people have, uh, you know, barbecues planned. Mm -hmm. Some people maybe want to get out on the golf course for uh, the last time for a little bit. Uh, Fiona, what's it going to be like for them? A little bit of everything, but all in all, I think uh, the weekend's actually going to turn out fairly okay. So let's take a look uh, at what has been happening today. Last day of the work week before the long weekend for many of us, 23 Celsius was our high. Humidex hit about 29, and then things have been getting a little cooler, a little grayer. Vancouver, under partly cloudy skies at this hour, 20 Celsius, although they have had periods of rain on and off today. 16 in Prince George, 22 in Edmonton with a fair amount of cloud cover, and Calgary, heavy rain bursts in the last hour or so, and uh, a severe drop in temperature from yesterday at this time when they were at 30 Celsius. Southern Saskatchewan, gusty, hot, and uh, pretty humid. Regina currently at 30 Celsius. And uh, portions of uh, Saskatchewan under severe thunderstorm watch. 
and warnings, and that's extending into Manitoba, basically from Flin Flon areas uh, eastward and all the way south to the international border, including Winnipeg. Uh, they're currently at 28. Their humidex topped out at 37 today. Hot and humid in Toronto at 27. And uh, Ottawa also experiencing the heat and the humidity. A little bit more cloud cover, but uh, both cities actually had humidexes hit about 36 today. Meanwhile, Quebec City uh, is experiencing a surge of heat, humidity, and rain compared to yesterday at this time. So a little bit muggy and definitely wet. Meanwhile, Fredericton is under cloudy skies. They're currently at 22 Celsius. And Charlottetown and Halifax, uh, both experiencing some pretty strong northwest winds up to 50 kilometers per hour. So it's making things quite a bit cooler. They're currently at 13 and 16 uh, respectively. St. John's currently seeing more rain. In fact, they've had a pretty much a rainy day throughout the day. They're at 18 Celsius. Now today we had a nice start to the day. Clouds though have been moving in and uh, will continue to do so into tomorrow. Uh, a lot of instability up to the northwest so many portions of northwestern Ontario could see some showers tomorrow. Thunder Bay probably won't see it until tomorrow night. It's going to move through. The brunt of it should be done by tomorrow morning sometime and then a mix of sun and cloud for the rest of Sunday as we just work out the tail end of this system. Temperature wise, uh, we're inching towards more seasonal values. We're still a couple of degrees off, uh, low 20s across much of northwestern Ontario, a little bit more heat as you head towards Manitoba. Overnight tonight, a comfortable low, low double digits for most of the region. Tomorrow, you can see we're definitely starting to see a cooling pattern into Sunday. And then on Monday, fairly consistent across much of the region, seasonal values, high teens, maybe one or two uh, low 20s. Now tonight, some rain up to the northwest, uh, but across the board, you can see the temperatures all for the most part in the double digits, just a couple of singles there. But tomorrow could see periods of rain across much of the region, with the exception, of course, as you head to uh, as far east as Sault Ste. Marie. At this hour, we're at 22 under mostly cloudy skies. A low of 11 under partly cloudy conditions is expected in Thunder Bay. So let's talk about the long weekend forecast. Uh, Saturday, variable cloud at about 21 Celsius. Could see or, or are expecting some rain overnight into Sunday morning. Then a mix of sun and cloud and a high of 21 once again. Of course, the Heimers Fall Fair starts on Sunday and again on Monday, partly sunny. 18 Celsius, so all in all, should be pretty good weather for that event. So you head back to the work week, warms up a touch. 24 on Tuesday, 23 on Wednesday, looking to be pretty dry and uh, just a little above seasonal for the start of the beginning of September. Well, if you're a fan of country music, this is an event you won't want to miss. The Niebing Roadhouse is hosting the Coors Light Stampede Night in just a few weeks. Brent Hawley has all the details in tonight's edition of Front Row Center. Well, hello, this is Front Row Center. I'm Brent Hawley letting you know what's happening in the community of Thunder Bay. Are you a fan of going out and socializing and having a great time? Of course you are. You're a fan of country music as well. Now that's the question because coming up uh, on Saturday, September the 14th, the place you want to be, the Niebing Roadhouse. That's right, the Niebing Roadhouse presents Coors Light Stampede Night. Throw on your cowboy hat, your tight-fitting jeans, a big belt buckle, and head on over there and have a great time. The Niebing is giving away a trip to see uh, country music superstar Jason Aldean uh, live in Calgary on October the 5th. Now it's going to be with uh, Jake Owen and Thomas Rhett now. It's going to include front row seats, flight and hotel for two nights. Now the Molson girls will be giving uh, away ballots and some other great prizes from Coors Light. You have to be in attendance in order to win. And again, that's happening on Saturday, September 14th. Front Row Center is brought to you by Teleco. We hear you at Teleco, your T-Bay Tel authorized dealer, 601 Central Avenue. Well, occasionally in our newsroom, you'll see a prank or two, but yep. nothing as good as the one we're going to show you after the break. Stay with us.
Well, this is quite the way to start your work day. Imagine this. You're headed into the office, coffee in hand, when suddenly, it's like a scene out of Jurassic Park. <laughs> Well, now, the human legs sticking out of that costume are a pretty good tip that this is a prank. But this poor guy is too terrified to even notice. The video was made for a Japanese TV show, although the raptor prank has been done before. It <laughs> never That's uh, excellent. Yeah, it's I'm going to so have to funny. do that at some point. Get me a big costume. <laughs> and just if I see you with a giant costume of a dinosaur, run, I thank you. I think the other way. go with a moose, though. It's a little bit more Canadian. It is more Canadian. <laughs> is. I'll have to think about that. Well, recapping our top story, Mayor Keith Hobbs wonders if maybe it's time to close down the Chippewa, Chippewa Wildlife Exhibit of this uh, in the wake of the death of the moose at the park. Of course, not all the councillors agree with him, so the debate has been open. Mm -hmm. And speaking of animals, the Blue Jays are in action tonight. Uh, they are at home against the Kansas City Royals, who have won six in a row. Plus, Matt Scooby will profile the LU men's basketball team as they continue practice. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great long weekend.